So up next is Dr. Ali Bramson. Ali is an expert in planetary geomorphology and processes related to ice and volatiles across the solar system, and in particular at Mars, where she's played a key role in shaping future robotic and human exploration. Allie got her PhD at the wonderful University of Arizona, um, two offices away from me. Um, and got her PhD in 2018, is now an assistant professor at Purdue University. And today she'll be talking about how geophysical observations can inform our understanding of ice and climate at Mars. Go ahead, Allie. Cool, uh, thanks James. I'm gonna share my screen. Is that working? Yep. Cool. Um, yeah, so um, thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm going to be talking about geophysical observations of ice and climate on Mars. And um, I was asked to sort of give a, a primer on Mars's climate history, uh, go through the gravity, topography, and radar observations of the polar deposits on Mars. Uh, go through radar observations and the debate on mid-latitude ice on Mars, and then also talk about prospects for the future, including static gravity fields uh, to search for ice and elucidate climate history, and then also prospects for future time variable topography and gravity fields to detect active climate processes. So to start, um, I'll give a, a brief primer on Mars's climate history. Um, so at the present day, uh, Mars is this cold, dusty desert. The temperatures range from like minus 225 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter to actually it can get up to like a balmy 70 degrees Fahrenheit towards the equator uh, in, the middle after in the middle of the afternoon during summer. Um, but the atmosphere is less than 1% of Earth's atmosphere, and it's also mostly carbon dioxide. And so even though you can get these balmy temperatures, liquid water is not stable because of these low uh, atmospheric pressures. But you can have lots of ice um, and these ice and, and uh, vapor processes, but it doesn't go through the liquid phase uh, when transitioning because of the low pressures. Um, ice is stable at the surface, but only at the poles. The lower latitudes are warm enough such that um, any ice has to be sort of insulated and, and buried to help protect it. Um, and overall, Mars is this dynamic world. There's dust storms, there's water and carbon dioxide clouds and snow and frost. And we'll go into that a little bit more throughout this talk. Um, and hopefully uh, you can sort of see how dynamic and active of a world Mars is from these animations here. This on the left is showing uh, dust devil going over the surface of Mars. Um, and then you've also got dust and clouds. Um, there's a gorgeous image from uh, the, the Perseverance rover uh, just, I think, a couple of days ago showing clouds. It's really cool. <laughs> um, so overall, Mars has three main periods of geologic history. Um, there's the Noachian, which is the oldest um, is where there was a lot of the, the big basins were forming, volcanism, a lot of cratering. The, there's the Hesperian, which is the sort of middle geologic period. And then the Amazonian is the most recent. Um, and by recent, I mean uh, about the last 3 billion years or so. So these uh, ages on the left-hand side are, are very rough, very approximate, but in general, the, the Amazonian is probably, yeah, the last few billion years. And in this time, this is where Mars has been characterized by it, by mostly these hyper-arid conditions, probably little liquid water, um, though you could occasionally have a fluvial, bursts of fluvial activity. Um, but you've got a lot of these ice and vapor processes dominating the climate uh, throughout most of this time. And in the Amazonian, um, the climate has really been driven by orbital variations analogous to Milankovitch cycles here on Earth. So Lascar et al. 2004 calculated solutions for um, like obliquity, eccentricity, longitude of perihelion for the last 20 million years or so of Mars's history. If you go further back than that, the solutions are chaotic. But statistically, they suggest that Mars had an, a maximum obliquity at some point in its past um, that could have been as high as 82 degrees. 
So obliquity is the tilt, the axial tilt of a planet. So that means that at some point in Mars's history, it may have been almost tilted on its side. And there's a nearly 100% chance that the obliquity has exceeded 60 degrees at some point in Mars's history. So obliquity is really important, especially when talking about the distribution of ice and volatiles, because that tilt of the planet affects the distribution of sunlight. So when you have um, a low obliquity or obliquity of zero, then the sunlight coming in is uh, most direct on the low latitudes at the equator, but the poles can be really cold. Meanwhile, if you have a higher obliquity and the planet's the, the axial tilt um, is higher, then you actually get the most direct sunlight hitting the higher latitudes of the, the planet. And so you can actually have a, a setup where the poles are not favorable to, to ice and the low latitudes in the equator can actually be some of the, the coldest parts of the planet. And so obliquity is really um, an important factor here. Um, the obliquity variations have a primary periodicity of 120,000 years. Um, so hopefully you can see this uh, periodic nature to the uh, obliquity. This is showing the last 10 million years uh, where 10 million years ago is on the left side present day is on the right side. Um, and then there's also the, um, the argument of perihelion, where perihelion is um, also has a, a periodicity to it of 51,000 years. And then the eccentricity of Mars's orbit also varies on 95 to 99,000 year timescales, as well as 2.4 uh, million. And one thing to note is that um, that Earth's variations in obliquity would fit between these two green lines. So Earth undergoes, um, you know, Earth undergoes Milankovitch cycles too, but um, the obliquity is only changing by about a, a degree from our current value. Meanwhile, Mars can undergo these huge variations. The amplitude is way higher, and that's because here on Earth, we've got our, our moon, which is, is very large and it helps stabilize us. And uh, Mars doesn't have that. And so it can undergo these much higher amplitudes in, in obliquity swings. So you can thank the moon for that. <laughs> and so, um, as I mentioned, ice stability is, is mainly controlled by this obliquity because it's so important for the distribution of sunlight on a planet. So at low obliquity, you can have these large extensive polar caps. Um, and then at high obliquity, you can actually get where the, the poles are unfavorable for ice to be stable. And so um, that can, can turn into vapor, go in the atmosphere, and then move around and condense out at lower latitudes where it's actually more favorable at these high obliquities. And today's obliquity is about 25 degrees, which is actually kind of coincidentally really similar to Earth's obliquity. And so um, this is sort of a moderately moderate low value. And so we've got these polar caps, but they might not be as extensive as they were in the past. And as I mentioned earlier, um, and I'll, I'll go into more detail, there's ice in the, the mid-latitudes, but it's not stable um, at the when exposed to the surface and to the atmosphere. And so as uh, Mars is going through this periodic uh, changes in it, its uh, orbit and, and axial tilt, it's sort of rotating between these different states. And so we think that um, ice and volatiles are a really good kind of tracer for these climate processes. And so Mars is a really excellent laboratory for how orbital forcing affects planetary climates, because first of all, it has this ampli uh, amplified forcing that it experiences. And there's also no oceans and humans and, and things that are, are make the, um, the situation more complicated here on Earth. And so, as I mentioned, since ice is really sensitive to orbital forcing, to use Mars as this laboratory for uh, planetary climate systems, uh, the first step is to know where is the ice now, and what are its properties, and what is it telling us about these, uh, this orbital forcing that led it to be where it is. So now I'm going to talk about gravity topography and radar observations of the, the polar deposits. And to start, I'm going to go through a couple key instruments for making these types of observations. So for gravity, uh, there's radio tracking by the Deep Space Network of a couple 
uh, orbiters that we've had um, at Mars, including Mars Global Surveyor, Mars Odyssey, and the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, and the sort of most recent model um, that's out there is the Goddard Mars Model 3. And this is a static gravity field of Mars in spherical harmonics to degree and order 120. And so this is showing the free air gravity anomaly map um, from this GMM3. For topography, we've got uh, MOLA, the Mars Orbiter Laser Altimeter, which is on board Mars Global Surveyor, which has collected over 600 million altimetry measurements. And the precision of the range in these measurements is on the order of tens of centimeters, um, though it can increase to, to meters on, on highly sloped surfaces. Um, and so we've got this uh, gorgeous elevation map from MOLA, um, and it's got a, a horizontal resolution of 463 meters per pixel or better. For radar, we've got two ground penetrating radar instruments uh, orbiting Mars that include the Sherrod instrument on board the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and Marsis on board Mars Express. And um, Sherrod operates at a center frequency of 20 megahertz with a bandwidth of 10 megahertz Marsis operates at uh, 1.834 and 5 megahertz with a bandwidth of 1 megahertz. So this translates into a, a vertical resolution, at least in free space, of uh, about 15 meters for Sherrod and then about an order of magnitude more for Marsis. But that resolution is sort of traded off with penetration depth. So uh, Marsis can penetrate uh, deep into the sort of subsurface um, up to about four kilometers or so in, in pure water ice. Um, and then Sherrod can't penetrate quite as deep. Um, and then the, um, this is showing an example of a Sherrod radargram. And so this is what the data set looks like. We essentially get these profiles into the subsurface um, where you get increased power reflected back off of interfaces between material properties, such as the surface, uh, the interface between the atmosphere and the, um, the surface. And then you can also detect changes in the subsurface when you've got these abrupt contrasts and material properties. So I'll talk more, this is looking over the North Pole and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So Mars's poles have these kilometers thick ice caps. Each are roughly dome shaped. They're about a thousand kilometers across. Um, and have about three to four kilometers of topographic relief compared to the surroundings, which we know from the MOLA data set. The total volume of ice is similar uh, combined to Greenland here on Earth. And these polar caps are a record of processes on multiple spatial and temporal scales. So um, going into more detail about what I mean by this. So on these polar caps, there's uh, the youngest and sort of topmost unit is the seasonal ice cap. So this is coming and going with um, throughout the year. There's the residual ice cap underneath that, um, which is persist from year to year. Underneath that is the polar layer deposits, which are the bulk of the, the polar caps. Um, and I'll go through each of these in, in a little bit more detail. And then underneath the polar layer deposits are a, a basal unit um, and the underlying and surrounding terrain, which then represent older uh, parts of, of Mars's history than the, those upper units. So the seasonal ice caps, up to a, a third of the atmosphere actually condenses out in the winter as these uh, depositions of dusty porous carbon dioxide ice. And I'll note in the north, you can also get an annulus of water frost. Um, so this carbon dioxide ice then sinters into a transparent solid CO2 slab. And then in the spring, particularly in the south, the bottom of that slab heats up and starts sublimating and forming pressurized CO2 jets trying to escape. <laughs> and you can, it can entrain dust and you get these fans of dust. Uh, this is showing an artist's conception of these seasonal CO2 jets spewing out this entrained dust. And then you can leave behind these radial channels called raniforms or colloquially known as spiders, which is what's being shown in this, uh, this high resolution image here. 
And seasonal changes have been detected in both the gravity data and MOLA topography elevation changes. And so this is showing the gravity data and looking at the, the change in mass over the North and South Pole over time. And you can see these periodic seasonal changes. And then also MOLA has, to, um, has detected elevation change on the order of about a meter over the course of um, a year as well. Um, looking at the, that buildup of the seasonal CO2 deposited in winter, and then it uh, retreats in the summer. And, um, and these measurements have been used to constrain the bulk density of this seasonal CO2 to um, around 910 kilograms per cubic meter, um, which I'll note is, is denser than like terrestrial snow, which has a lot of porosity. Um, and also CO2 ice is more denser than, than H2O. Um, the northern residual cap, so now this is underneath where the, the seasonal cap is coming and going, there's this residual cap. And in the north, this is meters thick water ice. And the water ice has been found to be uh, these large water grains. Um, and that indicates that it's old ice, such that they've uh, sort of centered in these large grains. And these large grains are being exposed in the summer, suggesting that there's um, net loss occurring such that you're exposing this old ice. But other areas seem to retain seasonal frost and seem to be accumulating. So there's a lot of temporal and spatial variability across the residual cap, um, but overall it appears to have a very young surface age on the order of thousands of years. And this is just showing the typical surface texture of the north residual cap. Meanwhile, in the south, the residual ice cap is made up of meter thick carbon dioxide ice, not water ice. Um, and you can see layers that indicate that this residual cap has been deposited in discrete events, but there's also pits and surface texture that show active erosion um, that occur from this ice cap. Um, and the annual mass balance, sort of similar to the north, is, is unknown because there's evidence of both accumulation and ablation happening. So what the net value is, is, is currently still um, an outstanding question. But overall, the recycling of the cap is proposed to occur in tens to hundreds of years. So underneath these sort of thinner surface uh, ice layers, you've got the, the bulk of the ice cap, which is the polar layer deposits. These are kilometers thick. Um, they're uh, made up of the polar layer deposits are made up of thousands of, of small scale layers that you can see exposed at the at trough and scarp faces. Um, and these layers are like tens of centimeters thick in the north and can be thicker, like meters thick in the south. And we can see at these exposures, as well as in the radar data, that the, the layering is laterally continuous across much of the polar cap, indicating that there's an homogeneous formation process um, that's depositing these across the whole area, um, but under these variable ice dust conditions, leading to where we can actually see all these layers that have um, different albedos, they protrude differently out of the, the wall, they have contrasts in properties enough to create a radar reflection in the subsurface there. And so we think that that's due to this different, um, different amounts of dust within different layers. And the North is expected to be about four to five million years old. Um, this is when the mean obliquity dropped to close to its current value. There was a, a shift in the mean obliquity about four to five million years ago. And so it's thought that with this shift to lower obliquity, this is when there's been this migration um, overall of, of ice, then back up to the poles, building up these polar layer deposits. The South polar layer deposits is older, however. It's, um, probably tens of millions of years old. And so it's interesting that there's this hemispheric kind of dichotomy in terms of the, the polar cap uh, ages and, and properties. And so from the ground penetrating radar data, um, you can see this is looking back at the uh, Sherrod radar gram and you can see all these layers that appear to be due to these contrasts in layers or um, probably packets of layers. Um, and if you look at the attenuation of the radar signal with depth, it actually doesn't attenuate much. Um, and so ice doesn't 
water ice doesn't really attenuate the, the radar signal, lithic material does. And so from this uh, lack of attenuation in the radar data, um, that helped us learn that the, the polar layer deposits are mostly water ice with little dust content. In the north, this is probably less than 5% dust, and in the south, it's probably less than 10% dust. Radar data can also be used to then look at the, the basal topography. So this is now looking at, this is the reflector associated with the bottom of the polar layer deposits and where they're on top of the, that basal unit. And you can see um, that that interface is really flat. And so this has been used to, to find that there's no downward flexure observed. Um, in this, uh, in the polar areas, uh, radar constrains it to about uh, like less than 100 meters of deflection, which indicates a thick elastic lithosphere more than 300 kilometers. And so this is then showing the basal topography as measured from Mars's uh, radar data then underneath the South Pole. And so gravity topography and radar can be used in concert with each other to constrain the density of the, the polar layer deposits. And so, um, assuming a surface topography from MOLA and then a basal topography from radar, this can be combined to model what are the gravity anomalies that would be associated with the polar layer deposits if they had um, different densities and find a best fit to the observations, which is what was done in this study by Zuber et al. 2007, looking at matching the, the model gravity to observed gravity um, and then finding the best fit. And so the density estimates um, for the south polar layer deposits um, been shown to be between like 1200 and 1300 kilograms per cubic meter. And then um, for the north polar layer deposits, they've been found to be for between 1100 and 1200. Um, and so this uh, is really complementary to the, the radar then, and, and both are showing this uh, coherent picture that the polar layer deposits are mostly water ice and don't have a large component of denser carbon dioxide ice and also have little sort of dust content as a whole. Um, and so um, radar and gravity are uh, two key tools for understanding the subsurface and each provides a constraint on composition. So radar can constrain dielectric properties, gravity can uh, constrain density. Um, but each of these in translating them to an actual composition is, is non-unique for each technique. So it's powerful to consider both together. Um, and then I'll also mention that the, the basal unit underneath the, the North Polar Layer deposits is composed of two units, CAVI and Rupees units, which provide a record of older climate. So the CAVI is the sandy aeolian or cross bedding that's weakly cemented by water ice um, and interbedded with pure water ice layers um, that's thought to be from the middle Amazonian. Um, and then the Rupees tenuous unit is more lithic rich and from the early Amazonian. And so from gravity, bulk density measurements have been placed on the basal unit of around 2000 kilograms per cubic meter, which means that the basal unit is probably about 50-50 water ice and sort of lithic and, and sandy material. Um, but I'll note that the gravity data can't distinguish between these two distinct units uh, currently. So now I'm gonna move on to radar observations and the debate for now mid-latitude ice. And I'll mention that um, in the last 10 years or so, there's been a lot of evidence for um, massive water ice in the mid-latitudes. Um, and one, one that I'll point out is uh, these ice exposing impacts. So we've got these images of, the, images of the surface and it'll just be this flat, dusty surface. And then another image will be collected a couple of months, a couple of years later, and all of a sudden there's a new impact crater that had formed there. Um, and in, in some places across the mid-latitudes, these expose and excavate nearly pure water ice, which is what you're seeing in this splotch of, of bright white in the image. And so these are showing um, that water ice is within, these craters are really small. So you can see the scale bar is 10 meters. And so there's water ice within about a meter of the, 
the surface. Um, but because these craters are small, we don't necessarily know um, how thick the ice goes um, and sort of how laterally extensive the ice is. Um, but I will also mention that these icy scarps have been found in a couple sites um, that show thick, like 100 meters thick deposits of, of ice. And so these are really exciting to have more direct evidence that you can have these thick deposits of, of ice in the very shallow subsurface in the mid latitudes, um, even though we're at these this lower obliquity today where the lower latitudes are not necessarily favorable for, for the stability of ice. And again, so that's where it's mostly underneath the, a surface insulating layer. Um, and then you can actually watch that when the, this ice is exposed to the surface because of the impact, um, these will fade over time as it sublimates into the atmosphere. And so like the pools, mid-latitude ice also records climate processes on multiple spatial and temporal scales. So sort of three main kind of types of mid-latitude ice include the latitude dependent mantle, which is being shown here. This is this um, dusty ice um, mantling that has been deposited over much of the mid-latitudes. Um, it's meters thick. Um, and again, it, it's this dust ice mixture that has been then getting dissected and uh, is retreating in, in recent times. And so it's this, it's patchy, it, it's latitude dependent, so it's more continuous at higher latitudes where it's still more stable. It's been more actively dissected uh, at lower latitudes. Um, but the age of the latitude dependent mantle is thought to be thousands of years to maybe early millions of years. Um, and so it's a relatively young unit. And then there's what I've been calling plains ice. Um, so this is was thought to be these more regional ice deposits across the Northern Plains areas, um, including what might be getting um, exposed by these ice exposing impacts, as well as, um, as, well as possibly these um, thicker deposits of ice, um, which could potentially be tens of meters to, to over a hundred meters uh, thick, which we also see in those scarp cliff faces. Um, and then there's also glacial landforms that um, look really analogous to glaciers here on Earth. You see like viscous flow features. These are, are old, hundreds of millions of years old, and the thicknesses are like hundreds of meters to a kilometer thick. Um, but they're located in these more discrete like valleys and discrete units. And so these regional, um, the regional plains ice is is what's probably most relevant to geodesy. It's also really important for human exploration um, and being considered for, given the that water is one of the most important resources that humans will need uh, for exploration. We need um, ice that's accessible. Um, and then it's also where the most debate currently exists. So there's uh, widespread radar reflections that have been detected in Arcadia Planitia and Utopia Planitia, two areas in the northern mid-latitude plains. And, um, and they've been attributed to these thick ice sheets, um, like tens of meters to over 100 meters thick. Um, and, in, um, and so for, for radar, you need some sort of topographic estimate to then constrain the dielectric, um, to know where that radar reflection is coming from, and then to constrain the dielectric uh, constant of the material. And both in Utopia and Arcadia, um, these studies found really low dielectric constants of the subsurface material, um, which led us both to conclude that there was very little lithic material um, and that this reflector is possibly due to this thick water ice in the areas. Um, and so, so this is one of the things I'm referring to when I talk about these plain sites. Um, but uh, a study by Campbell Morgan in 2018 found, looking at now the attenuation of the radar signal, that the radar signal is being attenuated more than what you would expect for pure ice. So these remnant glaciers 
um, have low loss values, um, but the Arcadia and Utopia reflectors um, have have higher loss than than those uh, the bulk of the remnant glaciers, um, and so that requires higher lithic content in the subsurface and has introduced. Um, more of a debate regarding the presence of, of thick, massive ice deposits at these locations. And so then the question is, kind of, do, does the ice that's being exposed by those ice exposing impacts, is that um, just a, a surface, like thin ice layer that's being exposed? Or is much of the, the ice that's being exposed and the ice across the mid latitudes more similar to those ice exposing scarp faces where it's it's over 100 meters thick. Um, and ultimately, we're, we're lacking instruments that can resolve this debate on decameters thick mid latitude ice. We don't have um, a lot of techniques that can really sense the upper tens of meters of the surface and resolve what's going on with this stratigraphy. Um, and so, how laterally and vertically extensive is the shallow plains ice is a big question, which is hu hugely important for human exploration and also for understanding how this ice was emplaced and understand the climate record that's recorded there. So, now I'm going to mention prospects for future static gravity fields to search for ice and elucidate climate history. And one of the, the big things that a, a new static gravity field can be used for is to constrain what's going on with mid-latitude ice locations and purities and elucidate orbital forcing processes that deposit this non-polar ice, um, which again provides a critical input for planning for human exploration on Mars, knowing how, how deep the ice is, how, how thick it goes, how much dust content is in it is really important. Um, and the current gravity field precision is weakest in the northern mid-latitude plains areas. That's what this uh, figure is showing here, which is uh, unfortunate for being able to resolve this debate from gravity data. Um, and so I'll just mention, yeah, red is higher gravity uncertainty. You can see where the Arcadia and Utopia uh, areas are. So right in these red patches. <laughs> Um, new static gravity field could also be used to constrain lateral density variations in the polar layer deposits, including the presence of massive carbon dioxide, um, which would help us, again, elucidate these past climates that form the polar caps, given that there's um, clearly temporal and spatial variability in past deposition of water, carbon dioxide, and dust. Um, and it would help elucidate these hemispheric asymmetries in Mars's dust and volatile cycles. And so one major thing to point out is that in the polar layer deposits in the south, radar data has, has actually found these massive deposits of carbon dioxide um, that are bounded by water, uh, thin layers of water ice. And we can see them in radar because the carbon dioxide, um, there's basically no internal volume scattering, there's no reflections, it's just like these black areas in the radar grams. Um, and the amount of carbon dioxide that's been sequestered in these uh, couple deposits is oops, enough that if they were released in the atmosphere, it would double the atmospheric pressure. Um, but there's no evidence for these carbon dioxide deposits in the north polar layer deposits, only in the south polar layer deposits. And so um, these will be, yeah, understanding how these got here um, would be important for understanding Mars climate history. And then also, I, I alluded to this earlier, but um, you could also determine the densities of the stratigraphically distinct Cavi and Rupes units in the north, um, which would help us um, learn about the climate conditions before the, the polar ice caps were in place. So looking back further into the Amazonian climate and currently uh, gravity data, the, these two units are, are unresolvable within just analyzing the basal unit. And now, um, so looking at prospects for future time variable topography and gravity fields, so looking at active climate processes, um, one big thing is to determine if the mass balance of the residual cap is negative or positive. So current estimates looking at um, like image data of the geomorphology and areas of accumulation and those pits expanding and um, it constrained the annual mass balance as being from minus six to plus four cubic kilometers per Mars year. So this number 
involves both negative and positive estimates. So we don't even know if the cat is net accumulating or ablating. Um, and this is important because it informs us on how does an individual layer of that makes up the polar layer deposits form, given that the residual cap is essentially the topmost recent layer of the polar layer deposits. And then how do these exchanges contribute to the secular formation and evolution of the polar cap? And so high resolution time variable gravity and topography could, could help address this. And then also it would help us map heterogeneities and depositional processes. So there's significant variability observed seasonally and interannually in both the timing and the placement of the deposition and ablation of, um, of the, the, these volatiles. And so high resolution data could constrain the composition of these deposits uh, as they form and evolve and why different areas may have different porosities or dust contents. And the spatial variability in surface density would shed light then into local and regional scale mass balance dynamics and this atmosphere surface exchange that takes place on Mars. So in conclusion, uh, geodesy provides an important tool for understanding Mars's climate and volatile cycles. And these uh, new higher resolution data sets would, would be really important for understanding the properties of these buried volatile reservoirs, including targets for human exploration, and um, would provide lateral and temporal variability in uh, current mass balance across Mars and provide these uh, keys to unlocking the climate record that's stored in the Martian ice deposits and use Mars as this laboratory for understanding the role of orbital forcing in planetary climates. And so I will, will end there. Thank you.